everybody Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is having a good day. I hope that you had a good week. I hope that things are going uh, somewhat uh, in alignment with what you would want to see in your life. If not, just keep pushing. Uh, whatever you do, don't give up. Uh, here we are again. One more segment of Riding with Rick. You know the routine if you like what you hear and see. Definitely click the like and the share button and subscribe if you want to continue to catch uh, the content that we are putting up on a regular basis. For those of you who have followed the work I've done over the last 30 years, the work that I continue to do in the areas of research and development, program development, uh, dealing with everything from mental health, adverse childhood experiences, uh, uh, African American adolescent and young adult male violence, domestic violence, uh, mental health, and so many other things. And we've been doing this for years. We continue to do it. Um, just finished the symposium, matter of fact, last month. Uh, have another one coming in a couple of months and a bunch of stuff in between. So, look, check this out. If you believe that, look in the description. But if you believe in it and you want to support it, uh, you want to see us advance the cause of literally empowering blacks through knowledge and agendas and strategies and development. Look in the description box and see how you can give and do just that. Give, donate. Uh, with that being said, look, I'm going to jump right off in this one. This is going to be another controversial topic. Uh, but those who have followed me for any time know that I'm not a person who avoids uh, conflict or avoids controversial issues. I'm not here to be a contrarian either. I'm not here for the purpose of going left all the time. I'm about the truth. I'm about calling things the way they are. Uh, and so that means at some point in time, I'm going to have everybody pissed off because it's going to be everybody's toes that ultimately get stepped on, including my own. Uh, so for those who don't know, uh, obviously, if you look at the credentials and the credentials that I normally post behind my name, the PhD and the uh, Psych D, um, aren't my only credentials, but those are the ones I put because those are the ones that are most applicable to the things that I'll be doing that's um, public. But anyway, one of my doctorates is in theology. So I have spent quite a a bit of time uh, developing my understanding of ancient literature in the way of expressing God, and that includes the Bible. And as a person born in a Christian household, and ultimately that's initially what led me to seminary was that, uh, but it was the th things I discovered in seminary that challenged me to look deeper and to explore more and to gain a better understanding ultimately put me at odds with the leaders in a lot of churches uh, because I just saw things that I felt that needed to be changed. I saw things that I felt needed to be brought to the people. Uh, I was threatened. Um, I mean, to the point of my life being threatened and a bunch of other stuff. And so I wrote a paper called, uh, entitled, um, The State of the Union of the Church. This was a while ago. It wasn't a very long treatise, but it was to the point of some of the things that we needed to do. One of the things was tithing and the tithing myth and basically how it's being taught in churches versus what literal ancient scripture and biblical scripture say about it. And it drew the ire, like I said. So I got blackballed and a bunch of stuff like that, which is great because it put me directly in the community where I wanted to be. But the question I have now is, what if the black church that is estimated to pull a par uh, approximately 300 plus mil um, a week out of the black community across the U.S. Um, what if the black church was actually doing what the church 
as a, as a whole is supposed to be doing? What if it was actually doing? Because now, if you go back to, you got to understand the vast majority of this money is being collected as tithes. Uh, the tithe is a Greek word that means tenth. That's that's all it is. But um, it is traditionally taught within Christian churches that tithing is an obligatory responsibility of every Christian which is in direct conflict of scripture but we're not going to get off into that right now but what happens is if you go back and you actually study when the law was being given down now tithing has always been a part of it you know like I say uh, long before the law came down Abraham gave uh, a tenth to uh, Melchizedek. Well, there's a reason for that, and it was still at that time a traditional thing when you waged combat on, in in the kingdom of a king uh, in in their dominion, and you waged combat. You won, and you took the spoils of that war. Ten percent of the spoils belonged to the king. It was just customary. as how it was done. So Abraham was simply practicing the customary practice of his time. But anyway. The teaching of tithing, uh, if you go back to scripture, is that there were three primary uh, uses of the tenth that God obligated Israel to pay. One was for support of the Levitical priesthood, which was the tribe of Levi, which was the only tribe that did not receive an inheritance of land. So what that meant was one of the ways that you develop, build wealth, carry wealth is through the ownership of land, property, real estate. So even the, and this goes on even to today. So because they did not get an inheritance of land, the other uh, tribes were responsible for supporting them. So one third of the tithe went to the Levitical priesthood. The second third of the tithe went to the caring for the poor and the impoverished. And I'm, I'm going to get back to that in a minute. And um, the other went to the feast and festivals, all you know, the feast of unleavened bread, Pentecost, all this stuff that they were required to keep on an annual basis. The tithes would support those feasts. And so the Levitical priesthood was supported, the poor were supported, and the in the feasts and, and all of the uh, events that God had commanded uh, Israel to practice uh, regularly was supported through the tithes. Uh, what we find is not all tithe. Number one is the poor obviously didn't tithe. They were being supported by the tithe. That's something to take. But also it was those who had herds and who had crops. It was those who could afford to tithe. And we can get into the biggest and the best and all that other stuff that you're often taught. God wants your biggest and your best. Uh, actually, God wanted the tenth. And so, for instance, if you had a uh, herd or a cattle and you would bring them under the counting rod, he wanted the tenth one to pass, the, each tenth one that passed underneath the counting rod. And it didn't matter whether it was good or as bad. Matter of fact, if it was good and you wanted to keep it, that was a way that you could actually uh, exchange something of value, pay in other words, to keep that one and pay a difference in, an, in another sum. So that's all that. But So I'm saying all that to say that if we were really doing what we were supposed to do, let's just say the poor. What if we were taking money out of these black neighborhoods? You know, if it's a black church and it's in a black neighborhood, that the probability is that that neighborhood is uh, filled with people who are at or right above the poverty line or in some instances below it and are probably doing a whole bunch of things they can't do and shouldn't be doing because one of the things you're supposed to be with anything that God gives you which includes the money you make and you earn is being a good steward being a good steward is not not playing your light bill to give to any organization including the church uh, with the hopes that God's going to bless you that's not how that works you manage with great propriety the things that are, you are blessed with being a good steward is a part of being godly uh, that isn't taught 
and it's a problem. And I could go way off into detail. I went way too far off into the left side of this than I wanted to. But what if we did? What if we put centers uh, to help educate our own kids within our communities from the church? What if we funded community centers that work with kids and gave them an outlet outside of being in the street and being direct targets for gang activity and drugs? What if we decided that we were gonna use some of that money to invest in creating our own uh, credit unions within the church so that we could lend to small business owners? What if we decided to use that to, to lend to homeowners to improve their property value and, and, and start businesses so that we could literally grow and improve uh, the value of our communities versus having others come in and do it gentrify it and drive us out because we can't afford the property taxes on the properties that we've owned for years that we fought bled, bled sweat and, and and did everything else to own we end up losing because we can't afford property tax on it and the game is constantly played while this same churches and I and when I say this I don't mean all because I know some guys who are uh, straight up guys who are out there dying trying to lift the community up and again those are the ones those are normally the ones that get the real true backing everybody follow it's always the ones uh let me just back off that but we got to do better but we we have these churches at over 300 million a week and I think I'm quoting that right, but it's it's some astronomical number coming out of the black. I'm talking black churches alone. Coming out of these churches, out of these black communities, uh, out of black pockets, out of black bank accounts, from black members, and and we are then on Sunday we are taking it, and we, on Monday we are depositing it into white banks. These same banks will not loan to black business owners. These same banks will not loan to black homeowners. These same banks are practicing some form of redlining right now today, but they'll tell you that it's over. Uh, the problem is it's not. The problem is if you look deeply, if the problem is if you really truly study it, you will find that there are systemic uh, discriminatory practices, systemic lending practice, uh, systemic dis, uh, discriminatory lending practices and so many other things across the board. Uh, we're still dealing with it. It's just by another name. These microaggressions along with macroaggressions are consistently and continuously happening. I am not saying, I'm not saying, hold on. I'm not saying that uh, to um, create an excuse. I'm saying that to, I'm saying that to lay out a foundation of what we're facing and to really truly put things into perspective and to challenge things and and my whole thing is there's no institution currently present in the black community more equipped to empower blacks than the black church and yet we remain at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder we remain the most oppressed and least progressive people and they will have you believe in society that it's because we're lazy it's because we have no purpose because we're just basically made like this and the truth of the matter is we get more out of anything than anybody else uh, we should have been off this planet a long time ago just based off of what we've been through and yet here we are still standing so I am going to challenge every last one of us to stand up and determine what we're going to do to be a difference maker what are we going to do individually collectively if you're a part of a church you need to be challenging the leadership of that church if you are the leadership you need to sit down and have a real long hard conversation with yourself um, about what you're going to do to be a catalyst for change uh, about whether or not how you're moving is truly uh, representing God and Christ in your life. Um, that's the challenge. I'm putting that in front of you. So again, I 
could literally just go on about this all day. And this came because of some stuff where uh, another pastor had ganked his congregation out of, I think, 2.5 million for some BS um, and got caught and now is in trouble and all of this stuff. And, and so it's just like that 2.5 million, how much could have been used to really truly build something outside of his bank account and his wardrobe and his uh, his passport uh, resume. I don't have a problem with pastors getting paid in direct commensurate alignment with what they're doing for their congregation. If you got your congregation laced, if your congregation being trained on finance and they are building wealth in your congregation, I don't have a problem with you getting paid and driving whatever you want to drive. But you cannot be driving that if you got a substantial amount of your members that can't pay their bills. Especially with the way most of that money is being pulled out of the pockets of those members. Uh, and like I said, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get a lot of pushback, but uh, I, I have never been about going alone to get alone. That's why I'm at where I am with uh, the church, man. I love my people and the God that I'm connected with would not be okay with what's going on in the black community and the black church, probably the church period. But I have to worry about what's, what's going on at home before I can get a little bit further out and start talking about all of that. So that's it for me. I'm, I'm going to drop it on that. I'm going to leave it on that. So that's it. Uh, if you like it, click the like button. Uh, definitely want to hear what you have to say about it. I, I definitely want to uh, get your insight, comment, uh, whatever it is. Um, also, as I said in the beginning, if you believe in the work we're doing and the work that we are pushing to do and we're striving to accomplish uh, in the black community, look inside the description box and give. On that note, I'm out. You guys take care of yourself.